<laughs> hey, what's up, guys? What is up? It is I. I am back once again. The Mech at Insane Disappearances. I hope you guys are ready to get your minds blown as usual as I read some insane cases. And one of them is a true story, a personal experience from my girl, my homegirl, Kim Star 66. Love you. All right. But in the news today, right here in the good old A, it is a state of emergency. That means we're having a snowstorm today. That means I don't have to go to work. Yeah. <laughs> Usually I love working, but in cases like this, when I get a chance to hang out with my YouTube family and blow their minds with some crazy cases, I definitely would, you know, love being at home where I got all the time in the world to do what I need to do. But, you know, I got all my rations. I got me some peanut butter and jelly. I got me some chocolate milk. And I got chicken. I got vegetables. You know, fresh leafy vegetables. You know, in the fridge and in the freezer. That way I have something to eat. You know, I know it ain't going to last that long. But you never know. But anyway, whew, this is going to be fun. Okay. Getting down to business. I got, like I said, two stories. One is an actual story of a disappearance in the Mesa Verde National, uh, National Park in Colorado and one is a personal experience well not her personal experience but it was her father's personal experience my you know my, my homegirl Kim Star 66 now um, she has a theory about what's going on with the people who are disappearing in these national parks and what may be taking them or it may be part of what be taking these people I think there's a lot of different variables and a lot of different um, uh, theories and there's a lot more than just that one reason why people are disappearing I just that's what I believe but um, she got the story from well she she didn't get she got it's the actual story that she's talking about from this website uh, or it was on Facebook rather it's called uh, high country news and um, it's about a disappearance of a of a man who went to a place uh, when well, he went to the Mesa Verde National Park. Now with this one, it started out by a person uh, who who heard someone calling their name. Let's see. Um, it all started with this part here. You see, on a scorching Sunday afternoon in early June, a man vanished. Uh, he told his wife uh, he was walking down to Spruce Tree House, a uh, ruin uh, just a quarter mile away uh, away on a paved trail. But he never returned. And by Monday morning, the park had organized a search. Um, it didn't sound promising. Daytime uh, highs were over 100 degrees the 51 year old carried no water no extra gear he was uh from uh Gol uh Goliad, texas or yeah i guess that's Goliad, texas you know, i hope i didn't I hope i got that right but anyway uh, uh Goliad, texas near sea level while uh while much of the park is over 7,000 feet high so the park uh sent out searches on foot Dog teams, horses, uh, dog teams and horses, and a helicopter um, clattered uh, low over the uh, Rocky Canyons uh, all day. I was visiting the park uh, that Monday afternoon, and I decided to hike the three-mile-long uh, Petroglyph uh, Point Trail, which splits off from the Spruce Tree House Trail. Uh, steep and rugged, it uh, uh, settles. It settles along uh, ledges and uh, alcoves, uh, squeezes between tall rocks, and uh, ascends uh, ascends rough stair uh, steps uh, hewn from uh, sandstone blocks. After an hour of walking, I suddenly heard a weary uh, male voice call, "I need some help." I thought of the missing hiker. Perhaps after uh, visiting Spruce Trail uh, House, he'd attempted to uh, he attempted this trail uh, and run into trouble I called out several times but got no uh, response I thought uh, I thought about going off trail to look uh, but figured I had become victim number two if I tried to scramble down those 
those ledges and cliffs, my cell phone had no signal. I had I, I hiked back down the trail as fast as I could, and when I found the chief ranger, I told him what I had heard. Uh, relief washed over his face as another staffer said, "We thought we heard a call for help in the, in that area yesterday." They quickly began planning to uh, bring in dogs and more searchers. I left the ranger station and stood looking at the opposite side of the canyon where I had heard the call. I said a silent prayer. I, I mean, see, uh, when I got back to my Western Colorado home and fought the following day, I checked the news thinking I'd, um, I'd read that the hike had been found and you know, had been found. Instead, I learned that Mitchell Dale uh, Steffling was still missing. Um, and now 70 people were looking for him. As I write this, it, it's it been almost two weeks since Steffling vanished and the search w uh, has been scaled down. A group of us uh, think he's still somewhere in the park and Chief Ranger Jesse Ferris I mean, said Chief um, Ranger Steffi, uh, uh, Jesse Ferris. Ferris. Um, excuse me. We've all heard of planned disappearances, but it doesn't uh, smell that way. Uh, the odds of him being found alive are basically zero, though uh, perhaps he fell between uh, big rocks uh, in a place where in a place where searchers can't see him. Perhaps uh, wind shifts uh, made the dogs miss his, uh, miss his scent. Uh, dying alone in the wild sounds like a free and romantic way of exiting this earth. And many of my outdoor friends say they, uh, per, uh, they prefer to perish outside, like Lawrence Oates. Uh, I might have to look into him too, because apparently he did the same thing, but if you if I probably read the story, maybe just maybe it might be something that is gearing towards the missing 411 cases. Who knows? But obviously, from what I'm reading here, he tried to disappear on his own by going out into the wilderness, you know, knowing that he was going to perish if he didn't eat or drink anything. But anyway, um, I told them in agreement, remembering the uh, remembering the member of Scott's ill-fated um, Ill 1911 polar expedition. <clears throat> uh, oh, let's see. Who walked out into the blizzard to die? On some freezing cold night, I'll I'll say what he did. Let's see. Uh, I'm I'm just going outside, and maybe some time. My friend Albert imagines another sort of ending. My last moment will be at twelve thousand feet in the th in a thunderstorm. Uh, there'll be a uh there'll there'll be a big flash and all that's uh, and all that'll be left excuse me is my my flask and uh my hiking boots and joe has and joe has already picked out a sleeping bag uh to be buried in <laughs> wow uh yeah they really thought this through uh let me see um but but is that really how any of us want to die? Alone in the wilderness, un uh, unattended, except by beetles and vultures. Ugh. I've seen vultures in action. It's ridiculous. It's like they all they all crowd around one carcass and just start pecking at it. It's weird. <laughs> um, let me see. Oh, yeah. Uh, better, I think, to be uh, with those you love. The writer and, and the, the writer Anna Marie Spagna applauds those who face the gentle night with um, agonized patience, and those brave uh, and those brave enough to usher them usher them through, rather than uh, champion one quick one quick cold night in the forest. Uh, when it comes to facing uh, death, she writes, uh, "I'll offer comfort, and when the time comes, I'll take it." Uh, I have no idea if Mitchell Dale Steffling was the man I heard calling uh, for help among the cliffs on that, that hot Monday morning, uh, hot Monday afternoon. I don't know anything about him, really, or his family, but I think that given the choice, his wife and daughters would have wanted wanted the chance to offer him comfort before he before he died. 
and I think he would have he he would have wanted the chance to uh, to receive. Now, this person who wrote this story, uh, her name is Jody Peterson, who is a contributor to uh, Writers on the Range. Uh, let's see, an opt uh, syndicate of high country news. Now, this uh, the website is called is called hcn.org. She is the manager. Uh, she is the managing editor of the magazine in Peonia, Colorado. Now, getting back to the story that my good friend, well, you know, uh, Kim Star sixty six wrote about. This is a personal experience of hers, which was actually her father's personal experience, but she wrote about it. You, she sent me an email about it. Now. She says right here that back in the year 2000, my family and I were my family and I were living on a different farm in a town called uh, King Kinga Kingaroy in Queensland, Australia, and it was mainly dense bushland. <clears throat> One day, my dad was on the property alone, but didn't know that we were not home, and he. And he had seen what he thought was my little sister, who was uh, seven seven years old at the time. Uh, so he so he had seen who he thought was her running into the thickest part of the of the bush. So he frantically started chasing her and calling her to come back, as she was not allowed in there. And she has mentioned that a lot of times before, how they were never allowed to go in certain areas because of. The strangeness that they go along, like um, this thing called bunyips and yowies and all that stuff, and possible trolls that live on the bridges in her in those areas. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah. However, she just kept running, uh, running further into the scrub. Um, at this point, he is thick in the in the scrub and can hear her laughing, uh, which is very strange because I see that in a lot of movies too. You know, where you see this strange person running away and they're laughing and just weird. Just like there was a, a segment in this cartoon I used to watch called uh, uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, uh, where the character Aang was in this swamp area with a lot of real th uh, thick brush and thick vines and tr real tall trees that practically reached the sky. Uh, he saw this girl running around. Uh, the swamp area giggling and you know she would stop for a second when he catches her she run off and just start giggling some more so it kind of reminded me of that it was very weird so if you guys ever seen that cartoon if your kids ever seen it try looking at that part right there where they're in this swampy area and he's running after some young some little girl in a white dress and she's giggling and but you can only see her from a distance you can't even see the her facial features it was just weird you know and spooky like but anyway um let me see let me get back on track here. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, however, she kept running further into the scrub, and, uh, and and at this point, he is thick in the scrub and can hear her laughing, <clears throat> and is getting glimpses of her running through the brush as she had on her bright pink raincoat. He was just seeing flashes of pink through the trees and scrub. After what he thinks was an hour he realizes he needed uh, to call for help to find to find her so he ran back to the house now at this point uh, it, well, at, at, it was at this point uh, that me my mom and sister pull up into the drive as we had as we had been out we see my dad running full pelt towards the house holding his head so we were alarmed as we uh, knew something was wrong he all uh, we all got out of the car and then my dad stopped uh, my, my dad just stopped dead in his tracks and stared at us all he uh, his face went white and he looked terrible it was because he had he, he had seen my sister get out of the car so he knew whatever he would what he, whatever he had been chasing wasn't her at all uh, now as she got out the car she was wearing her pink raincoat, which was the crazy part. Now, my parents didn't tell didn't tell us the story until years after we moved from the moved from the farm, and my sister and I 
could never understand at the time why she was uh, banned from wearing her pink raincoat. Yeah, I can understand why. <laughs> I wouldn't want to relive that moment either. Okay, uh, my dad still doesn't know what he was chasing that day, and he still gets shaken up uh, just talking about it. For all I know, if he kept uh, following her, he could he could have gone missing, or maybe it was just some kind of entity. Hmm. Who knows? Either uh, either way, we will probably never know. And then she goes on to say, "Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the story." Yes, I did. It creeped me out, but I was excited at the same time because it had flair, it had suspense, it had a lot of scary moments, like you know, you like your typical <clears throat> scary woods story, like the whole Jason thing. You know, you running into the woods trying to figure out who that was, you know, making all that noise, and you calling out their name, say, "Is that you?" And he, you know, but anyway, that was an amazing story. I said it before, and I say it again. You, my friend, I applaud you on that, and I am very, I am so very glad that your your father is alive and well, and he came back from that. Yeah, he got freaked out, and when he, I'm pretty sure when he saw your little sister, he probably wanted to run over to her and hold her so tight that he never wanted to let her go. You know, because that is weird. Because can you even imagine you running into the woods, right? And you see your little girl running away from you into this thick brush. And she's constantly just running and running and running away. You call out to her, but she acting like she can't hear you. And she's just giggling. You know? So that leads me to believe that her theory is spot on correct. Think about it. You got these people that seem to wander off into the, the woods or into the forest or in the national parks. Maybe. Just maybe. When they go into these areas, they hear someone calling out to them. And it's it's in most people's nature that if they hear someone calling for help, they're going to try and help them. I know I probably would, but given the fact of all these cases that happen in these national parks, I probably wouldn't. Not to say that I'm not that that I'm not the kind of person that want to help somebody. I am, which is why I'm doing these stories or reading these stories to you guys on my on my channel. But to know that something like that happens in these parks where you hear this voice calling out to you or calling out for help and you try to find it and then all of a sudden you disappear along with that voice which is like it kind of thinks makes me think that whatever this is is luring you into the woods knowing that you're gonna be curious enough to f try and find out who is this person calling you and maybe you can help them out if they're hurt or whatever now if it's somebody that's in the woods that is calling out for help you would think they would know to shoot off to, sh to shoot their gun into the air three times every 20 minutes so that someone can hear them. But it doesn't happen in these cases. You just hear that voice. You try to find them, and sooner or later, you disappear. You know? So I can understand where her father was coming from because he's running and running and running and running, and he realized that he can't catch up to her because she's just too small and she's too fast. She got them little legs, but she's quick. So he runs back for help and sees his daughter get out of the car. He said, Wait a minute. If that's you, who the hell was that I was chasing in the woods? <clears throat> makes you think doesn't it I'm just saying with stuff like that it makes you not want to go into the woods even though David Pilatus says every single time I don't want to keep you from going into the woods because there are people out there that love nature but you have to be prepared of what can probably happen and it may happen to you I'm not saying that it will but it just may happen okay so the one thing you always have to remember that you would or what you need to have before you go into those areas you have to have number one a personal locator transponder a gun if you have a license and a group to travel with and when I say that I mean you got to be in a tight group I'm talking so tight that you got to walk in back to back you know just taking one step at a time so that you won't stray away from the group because think about it you got people who fall behind and then you got people that run ahead now, these same people that get away from the group and when they're alone, that's when they're snatched up just like that. Real quick, because you could be in a group, you're jogging, you know, on a trail. <clears throat> a person falls behind, try, probably trying to catch their breath. And they're like this here. <sighs> they're holding on to their knees, they bent over, and they're like this breathing real heavy. And all of a sudden, it gets quiet. You look around, they're not there. And the person that gets ahead of the group says, you know, I'm going to, while you guys rest, I'm going to run on ahead up to this little spot around the corner. And I'll meet you at that big boulder that's, you know, a couple of clicks away. 
Y'all catch your breath. You get up and you run to the, you jog to the area where they're supposed to have been at, but they're not there. They're never found. They look and look and look and never find them. And when they are found two weeks later, and that's if they are, they're found in an area like, say, a gully, a, a box canyon. They're in an area where they never should have been in the first place. But when they examine the body, what happens? First, they find them, you know, well, most of the people that end up being found in gullies or box canyon, they only really find the bones at that point. But the ones that are found, you you know how that goes. They're found with no clothes except for their underwear on, no shoes, and the body is pristine like as if they were never in the, you know, in the wilderness. Okay, like, and they're bone dry. The body's bone dry. But you in a wet area. Makes no sense whatsoever, right? Of course. But this is the even crazy part. They never find a cause of death. So that means whatever this thing is feeds off of your energy or your spirit. Okay? You know, it, or their soul. They feed off of their soul. And that's how they stay alive. By drinking your soul right out of your body. It's like someone would take a straw shove it in your mouth and just start drinking at it <laughs> you know and suck it up therefore you have no soul therefore no life i don't know that's just a theory of mine but that seems to be what the case is all about when you find these people that ain't got no cause of death you know just like once again i've said it before and i'm saying it again henry mckay perfect example okay you hear him moaning and groaning in pain on that voicemail then what happens all you hear at that point is him moaning and groaning, but you hear also a growl in the background. And then you hear some man, some unknown person saying, stop it. So that leads me to believe that whatever this, whatever that thing was, it was working right along with this person. I don't know, because if you're going to say stop it and he stop and that thing stops, which is also a growl, you'd be like, OK, obviously that whatever that thing was, was hurting him. But when they find the body. What did they find? Nothing. They just found a dead body. And it, they didn't mention anything about the nature of his body as far as him being half naked with just nothing but his underwear on and no shoes. But they said they didn't find any signs of trauma on the body because he sounded like he was in a lot of pain. Maybe abdominal pain or his whole body was probably hurting at that point. So this leads me back to my theory, my own personal theory about that creature having some sort of mind power that gets into your head and causes some type of some type of brain trauma that affects the entire body. I don't know, but that seems to be what this is all about. But you got so many people out there that have all these theories, but they all be looking for proof and evidence to state that this is what it is. The proof is right there. It's in the cases. It's in the evidence. It's in the characteristics of the story itself, which is not an actual story. It's a true case that you read about in a book or whatever the case may be okay but there are so many people there are so many people out there that just don't want to believe that something that weird caused their loved one or child to die they would rather believe that a person a man or a woman kidnapped their child or abducted them and killed them so they won't talk but when you get to the body and you examine the evidence None of that stuff is a part of that. I mean, it, it is strewn from that. Okay? Eradicated. No part of it. Okay? So the only thing you have left is the weird theories of what may have happened to that person. Okay? I'm just saying. So, this right here. Oh, my gosh. Kim Star 66. Huh? I love you, man. You are the best. You have some of the best stories. Even that one about you about the, what your husband went through. Okay? And this is this is the crazy part. Your father and your husband, they both came back from that. They had it's like their minds were evolved enough to say, Oh, I need to go get help. Oh, I need to get away from you. This doesn't look right. It doesn't look safe. Now, other people would just let their minds go and they would get taken over by whatever this thing is and make them walk across that bridge. Next thing you know, what happens? The boards give way because it was one of those little bridges that had those little boards, those little planks that go all the way across, you know, like a footbridge. And we're talking across a canyon. There is no way in hell I would even do that. And her husband obviously was thinking the same thing. He knew not to do that. And he said him he said it himself that it didn't look safe. So he backed away and walked back to the campsite or wherever it is they went to. 
Okay, so both of your your father and your husband were very smart in that area. They knew that they needed help or they needed to get away from there. Love it. So I'm glad they're all safe. All right, so right there, that's that personal experience right there. And to all of my other viewers, I am going to get to your emails and I'm going to look into all those cases that you guys, you know, told me about. I promise you that. And the same to you, Elizabeth. I will make sure that I get to the cases that you sent to me, you know, in an email. So I got to go through all of them one by one because I'm getting a lot of emails. So I got I need the time in order to go through each one and, you know, read about it and post it on my next video. So I will be doing that in the next coming days. So don't you guys worry and you guys will get your props. And, it's a, and to you, Dan D.A., thank you about that information about uh, Kendrick Johnson. I'm going to look into that, too. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to see if there's some stuff in it that they may have found that can be actually put into the Missing 401 books. But anyway, that's my time. I got to go. I got to call in so I can get my time for today since it's a state of emergency. <laughs> I love those words. But anyway, always in party. Aloha. Mahalo and uh, hui ho. Peace out, guys. Be safe and be blessed.